Father, I ask you for the call of God to come back to the church, the body of Christ, like never before, the call of God. And that the importance, God, that you have set aside to be placed upon that call as you speak to an individual, and it is confirmed through prophetic utterance, Lord, the call that you have placed on individual's life takes a preeminence. It's our relationship with you, Jesus. It's my relationship with you, Jesus. It's my relationship with my wife. It's my relationship with my children. But I have a relationship with you that's calling me around the world. But I have a relationship with my wife that she understands the call to go around the world. She and I have a relationship that she knows if I say, I got to go, then she says, you go. And there's times he'll say, then I want you to go with me. And she'll say, because we have a relationship with the Father and we have a relationship with each other, then there's times that we go into the Horn of Africa. There's been times if we said goodbye and prophecy was given over us and it was false prophecy, they came to my wife and they told her, they said, if he goes this time to Indonesia, I believe it was Indonesia, if he goes to Indonesia, he's going to die over there. And you know what Kathy did? Kathy said, we don't believe that, but he's going. So basically, we come to the decision that God told me to go, and if I die there, I die there. (laughs) The call of God. Somebody said, well, that's the call of God on your life. That's not the call of God for everybody. Can I say something to you? Do your job. Serve the Lord from the position that he has placed you in. Don't let anybody talk you out of what God has told you through that book. You hear what I'm saying? Oh, mother, mothers of Zion. I want. I need to come down here and look you in, in the eyeball this morning because I know this is here. I'm coming to you as a pastor, but I'm also coming to you as a father over this house. And I'm not putting myself in a position that I don't believe that God. My gift is going to show this morning. And my position in God is going to show this morning over this house. You might not agree with it. And at the end of this service, you might say, I don't know about that. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm coming to you. And I'm not afraid to stand in my position, to stand in my call and stand in my gift. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Lift your hand and wave at me. I'm not afraid to do it. Am I nervous? Yes. But I'm not afraid. This is not a community church. This is an apostolic body. Haven't come here to say, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Maybe we'll do that. Oh, you know what? That's something that we really need to do. No, that that ain't not. What's God saying? What's God saying? Not talking about coming out of a prayer room where I've been with a whole bunch of other men and women. I'm talking about going into a prayer room, putting your head. See, I can already feel that thing. I can already feel it. It's here. You've allowed flesh to diagnose. You've allowed human reasoning and human logic to invade your prayer chamber and take advantage of your spirit. Some of you have done it. I'm not afraid to say it. Your flesh taking advantage of your spirit. Somebody said, that's impossible. You don't have scripture for it. Listen, when Peter was standing before Jesus, he said, I'll go to prison with you and I'll die with you. There's a lot of things we say when we are in the presence of the Lord. But I want to tell you what happened. Peter made that statement, but his flesh overruled the spirit. Because the statement he made was right. What about David? What about David when he came to a place in his life? David came to a place in his life where he had never lost. I I never planned this, but I'm going to talk to you. Look at me. Look at me. It's very important you know who you are in Christ, but I want to ask you a question. Do you know where you're at? Not just as an individual. I'm talking as a body. I'm talking as the kingdom moves. David, man, David won every battle on the battlefield, never lost a battle on the battlefield. 
Every, you've heard me say it before. Every young woman wanted to marry a man like David. Every young man wanted to be like David. David was a household name. I'm telling you, God honored him. God guided him. God directed him. God moved to him and through him like never before. But he, you know what happened? He allowed the flesh to position him when he did not inquire of the Lord. Someone said, you don't need to inquire of God everything you do. Oh, yes, yes, you do. If it's a move in your life, listen, I'm not going, I, if God tells me I'm on my way to Vons and he says go to Food Co., I'm going to Food Co. How many of you understand what I'm saying? If he says don't go to Food Co., go to Walmart. I'm, I don't like going to Walmart, but I'm going to Walmart. How come? Everybody say because God said. We're not talking about you and your house. We're talking about the vision in this body. How many of you heard what I just said? The vision in this body. Huh? I, I heard the flesh for the last three months say, if you would just. And it was such, we saw it the other day at that meeting, didn't we? What happened the other day at that meeting? All we did was just sit there and listen. After it was all over with, all of a sudden, God began to broaden the platform of this house in a city meeting, did he not? When a certain individual gave me her personal cell number, somebody said, oh, you're just, no, I'm talking about the platform of this house. God is wanting to enlarge the platform of this house. This body of believers is supposed to be an epicenter, and we are also supposed to be, listen, a what? Say it again center of influence but I'm going to ask you this morning who and what's influencing you because I'm going to tell you something ladies and gentlemen we are living in a day of deception such as never like before. Matthew 24, we are smack dab in the middle of it. The thing that is mentioned the most in Matthew chapter 24, and it is speaking about a spirit of deception that will come, and it will be such a spirit of deception to deceive that even the very elect would be deceived if it were possible. And there might even be people saying here right now, well, you're the one being deceived, Pastor, because that's the level it's going to. I'm telling you. And I hear, I'm hearing this thing with spirit. Well, you don't have the revelation. Of it. Thank God for your revelation. Does it line up with the word? And the word is explained not through human logic and human reasoning to bring you to self gratification. Gratification? No. Uh -uh. You hear God? You hear God. I'm not trying to get you to doubt you don't hear God. I'm trying to move you into a place where you have postured yourself and you can discern the difference between the lights. See, it's not hard. It's not hard to differentiate and it's not difficult to, to, to discern light from darkness. Everybody, how many of you know that's easy? Lift your hand. When the lights go out, it's dark. Hey, when the lights come on, it's light. It's not. Listen, do you realize that the Word of God says... Listen, now, this is the discernment that I'm praying over this body of believers that we discern the difference between the lights because the Bible says that there are going to be false prophets in the last days that will transform themselves into angels of light. Do you know that the spirit of Antichrist is going to be able to show signs and wonders and miracles? And it, but it looks like light. It's not dark. The dark, the light in them is darkness, but it shows itself as light. You've got to be able to discern the difference between lights. Then that scripture goes on to say, and don't marvel at this for Satan himself. Satan himself transforms himself into a what? A light. How many of you want to be able to discern the lights? Lift your hands. I mean, okay. All of a sudden, this guy's prophesying, declaring, and decreeing. Uh, are you with me? No. No, look at me. I want to know when the individual's speaking what spirit they're of. And I'm not talking about in church. I'm talking about in life. I'm talking about on YouTube. How many of you hear what I'm saying? I'm talking about, I'm talking about lit, knowing and discerning the light. If deception's going to an all-time high, you know what's got to come to an all-time high in this house? Discernment. Look at me, Brian. Brian, you with me? Shut out the lights in this house. 
Let's go ahead and turn them off. Okay, it ain't, it ain't difficult. Now, it's dark, and I really can't discern who's out there, where you're at. Okay, turn the lights back on. It's dark. It's darkness. It doesn't take a man of God. It, it was, how many of you with me? Okay, but now it's light. And everyone in here is in light. But what we got to discern is the difference between the lights. Listen. Someone said to me, can I pray for you? And, and you know what, Steph, in me, there was a hesitation when they asked me. There was a hesitation. And then I said, yeah, yeah, you can pray for me. So they prayed for me. And after I walked away from the prayer, they said two things that were key things. Two things that were key things. And then I prayed about it for three days. And the Lord said, was that me? But they said two th- key things. And I'm thinking, man, God, that's you. That's you. That's you. Because they said two key things. And it was like the Lord said to me, don't get your cart before the horse, Tim. I want you to go back and revisit that. How many of you hear what I'm saying? And I come to a different observation when I begin to discern. I'm going to stand in my place this morning, and I'm not meaning that with pride, prestige, or not against anybody. I'm talking to this body of believers. In this house, we're going to go through the gate. We're not coming through the back door. We're going to go through Christ. We are not hirelings here. No, I'm telling you, you're going to walk in this. You're going to walk in freedom. You're going to walk in a liberty. You're going to walk in a place where your mind does not meditate on certain. Immediately, all you're going to do is just shake that thing loose. You hear what I'm saying? It's going to happen. Listen. After this morning, I hope everybody loves me. Well, if you don't, you can't go to heaven. So I'm bringing it to you out of love. Yeah, see, I can tell. Somebody said you're on to something. Yeah, I've been in prayer and I've been skipping some meals. And all of a sudden, the Lord says, I want to broaden the platform of this house. And I've been trying to broaden the platform of this house, Tim Sumner, but you wouldn't allow it. So before anything else, God straightened me out in some areas. How many of you with me say yes? Here we go. Somebody said, yeah, dismiss the kids. I'm not going to today. I want them to sit under this. I'm not going to today. Listen to this. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him, in Jesus, should not perish but have everlasting life. For God the Father so loved the world that He gave Jesus Christ His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. How many of you know that? Lift your hand and shout, yes. Jesus hanging on the cross of Calvary, giving gave His life, spilling His blood, so that you and I could be reconciled with the Father. The Father offers us, gives us His best through Christ. How many of you want the best that God has to offer? Lift your hand and shout yes. No, no, you really want the best. Shout yes. Reconcile with the Father to receive from the Father His best. His inheritance, His inheritance for you and I, sons and daughters, is His best. Listen, his best. We want the best that God the Father has to give in this life. Listen, in this life and in the life to come. God has a perfect plan. His plan has been revealed through Jesus Christ. As I wrote, bear with me as I wrote this. He said, don't leave anything out here. God has a perfect plan. His plan has been revealed through Jesus Christ. A plan of reconciliation that includes repentance. Not just repentance for salvation, but repentance as a Christian. How many of you are with me? Stay with me. Repentance is an opportunity for all sinners to make the choice to turn from sin and to turn to God. Listen now. Being saved doesn't immune you from sin. We've seen it on a worldwide platform 
in the lives of leaders. If it's in the lives of leaders, it's in the life. Listen to me. Being saved from sin doesn't immune you from sin. Confessing your sin to God, I believe, is very critical even after salvation. And I believe it's very healthy in our walk with God. If you're with me, say yes. Listen now. God loves you. You love God. But when you as a Christian sin, when you sin, listen, somebody said, I've always heard there's a separation. Does the Bible say that sin separates us from God? Does it? Can you continue in your sin and have a relationship with God that you had when you first? Can you continue in a strong, firm, built relationship with God? Brittany, I'm asking you. Can you do that and continue in what you have received in sin? Can you continue in sin and have a relationship with God? I mean a strong relationship. Stay with me. When you sin, a barrier. God is a God of love. You love God. God loves me. I know God loves me. And I'm not belittling that. The love of God is the most important thing in my life. He keeps coming after me. All my faults, all my failures, all my hang-ups, all my mess-ups. He's always there, right? going down the road. You know me. I've told you about, I've had road rage in the past. How many of you ever had road rage? How many of you ever had cat and dog rage? You kick the cat, you cuss the dog. I mean, anyways, watch now. Going down the road, somebody comes on the freeway, runs me off the road. Look, I'm just going to say it. You stupid. Okay, at some point or another, do I need to pull that car over and repent? Oh, no, you don't have to. Just bear with me. I want to ask you the question, have we been made in the likeness and the image of God? Is God's main purpose, according to the book of Romans, is to transform and conform you and I into the image of His Son, Jesus? Am I talking Bible, Annie? Am I talking Bible? Annie, you know this. Am I talking Bible? I'm not talking about human logic and human reasoning that tries to water stuff down. Listen, if you're here and you're trying to water stuff down, don't water it down. I'm not saying people are. I'm just simply saying, I see it coming. with me, Ronnie? You're shaking your head so hard, yes, that it's about to fall off. How old are you, Ronnie? Somebody said, you're looking for somebody to agree? Huh, I'm obeying God right now in this house. Well, I don't like it when I feel bad. Conviction is not something that makes you feel good. If we can't discern between the two lights, how do you expect to discern between condemnation and conviction? Have we lost our true identification with God because of our discernment? Robert, I'm taking my place this morning. Joe? Watch now, stay with me. God loves you, God loves me. But when does a sinning Christian become a sinner? Listen what David says. David says, I acknowledge my sin to you, O Lord, and I didn't cover my iniquity. I said, I listen to this. I said I will confess my transgressions to Jehovah and Jehovah, oh God, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Everybody say reconciliation. Come on, say it with me. Say reconciliation. Repentance. How many of you since you have been born again There was times in your life when you knew what you did was wrong and you went to God and you confessed and repented. Lift your hand real high. Please don't lose that. Please don't lose that. 
Don't turn it into legalism or religion, but do not lose that affection that you have to please God. Please don't lose it. To please God. Everybody shout, please God. Okay, here we go now. Lee, at any time, precious, whenever you feel like it, you can, you can step down. I appreciate you standing. Appreciate you being here. Here we go. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 31 says, everybody say Deuteronomy. I don't even know if I say that right. I sure try hard. But listen, this is what it says. Deuteronomy 11, verse 31. Okay, we're going to go quick now, and I'm going to say a whole lot of things. If you're with me, shout yes. God spoke, and this is what He said. He told Moses and He told the children of Israel, For you shall pass over Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you, and you shall possess it and dwell therein. Listen, what He said. You go in and possess the land. Now watch this. Don't let the land possess you. Did you hear what I just said? Don't let the land possess you. You possess and live in the land. Don't let the material things that come out of the land possess you. But you possess the land. And you use what comes off of that land to bless me and to bless your families. But don't you allow the land to... Are you with me? Everybody say, we're going to possess the land. Come on, somebody shout, we're going to possess the land. But don't let the land possess you. Listen to what he said. He said, cross the Red Sea. After 430 years in Egypt's bondage as slaves, God the Father brought the children of Israel out of Egypt's bondage. One... Uh, uh, um, uh, of the Bibles I was reading, one of the versions said this. This is what it says. After 430 years, they came out of Egypt's bondage, and they left Egypt's bondage with boldness, the children of Israel. Listen to what it says. It says, and they crossed the Red Sea. Everybody say, cross the Red Sea. Some theologians say is this, that crossing the Red Sea was a symbol and a type of conversion, coming out of bondage and slavery. Somebody said, yeah, but then they went into a wilderness. After Jesus was baptized, he went into a wilderness too. The wilderness was only supposed to represent a process, not a cycle. They got caught up in a cycle of wandering with their feet. The children of Israel were caught up in a cycle of wandering with their feet for 40 years. That's 14,600 days. They wandered an 11 to 14 day journey into their promised destiny, crossing the Jordan River, which was symbolic of going into a deeper walk with God. You are in your destiny. Now walk it out daily. Everybody say, in my destiny. Come on, shout it out. Say, in my destiny. Walking it out daily. That wilderness was just supposed to be a process to make sure all of Egypt was out of them. It's one thing to come out of Babylon. It's another thing to get Babylon out of us. Stay with me. So they crossed the Red Sea after 430 years. The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, 14,600 days. They got caught up in a cycle of wandering with their feet. The cycle we get caught up in today is wandering in our minds. Cycles. Listen, in life there are good cycles and there are bad cycles. Everybody say, it's time. Come on, talk to me. Say, it's time to destroy bad cycles. How do you destroy a bad cycle? How do you destroy it? Well, the children of Israel caught up in this cycle for 40 years. 40 years of wandering. 40 years of rehearsing a promise day after day after day. Going up and looking into the promised land, but never being able to step into that destiny and walk it out daily. Everybody say this. Say, Jesus is my destiny, and in my destiny, I walk it out daily. Listen. So how do you destroy a negative cycle that keeps you wandering? 
to break the cycle, God commanded the children of Israel. He commanded them. I want you to hear this. He commanded them under the direction of Joshua. He said, I command you to cross the Jordan River. Cross the Jordan River and go in and possess the land of Canaan, the land that flows with milk and honey, the land that was given and sworn to us under the direction of Moses. Now it's time. So Joshua got the people prepared. Man, he poured into them. He told them the divine direction of the Lord. They did it exactly like the Lord said. When the priest stepped into the Jordan, the waters begin to part. They walked across on dry ground. Immediately, the cycle was broken, and the things that they had disengaged from, they re-embraced. And I'm going to tell you something. There's some of you that's disengaged from some things because people that you watched and you saw them enjoying what you call joy they we need to go back and look and see if what we disengaged from God really called us to disengage from it or if it was people just talked us out of it somebody talked the children of Israel out of Passover and circumcision But immediately after they crossed over at a place called Gilgal, Candace, a place where what has been tolerated for 40 years is rolled up, cut off, and thrown away. They reestablished what they had disengaged from, and that was what? Circumcision. Everybody say circumcision. Getting rid of excess flesh. The number two thing that they re-embraced was Passover. They re-established Passover and they re-established circumcision. And immediately after those two things were re-embraced, all of a sudden, Vivian, God gave them a word. How to overtake and establish victory over Jericho. God spoke to Joshua and he said, Joshua, I want you to go to Jericho and I want you to march around the city one time for six days on the seventh day. The priest will give a long blast on the ram's horn to command the people to shout and the walls will come falling down flat, but only save Rahab and her family. Listen. And then he said, I want to remind you and remind the children of Israel That when victory is established, whatever you do, do not partake of the silver, the gold, or the precious spoil that you see in the city. That gall goes into the Lord's treasury. It's not for people. If you take it, it becomes a curse. If God gets it, it becomes a blessing to you. But God is not going, He's not going to allow you to bless yourself. It has to come into His treasury. Then out of His treasury, He blesses you. I don't know if you heard what I just said. Everybody say, God blesses me. Say it again. Say, God bless me. Something happens when we start blessing ourselves. I don't know. Are you you with me? Watch this now. So all of a sudden, the day came. The order had been given. The command had been given. They are in their promised destiny. They are walking out their destiny one step at a time, one day at a time. Now watch this. Then all of a sudden, Joshua sends some men down to Ai. Stay with me. He said, go scout out Ai. Now, they went and scouted out Ai, and the men came back and they told Joshua, they said, look, only send two or 3,000 men down there because Ai is just a little bitty place. We'll wipe them out, no problem. Victory's going to be established, no big deal. Now, listen, listen. The greatest victory that Israel had ever been a part of, they celebrated, there was jubilee, there was a public, the greatest public victory ever was when they established victory over Jericho, but in their greatest public victory, there was a secret private failure that they never found out about until they were going into their next warfare. Are you getting this? I'm telling you, I am giving you a picture this morning of where the church world is at in the United States of America. We have wondered, then all of a sudden we get our wits about ourselves, we're hearing from God, and we go in and we reestablish some things that we have disconnected from, or if you have it and God deals with you, you should. How many of you with me? Victory is established, the greatest public victory ever, but in the midst of their greatest public victory, there was a secret private failure that nobody knew about until it manifested in defeat. The children of Israel should have went to Ai and just took Ai, no big deal, but they couldn't take Ai because all of a sudden, when they came back, 
36 men of Israel had been killed. Joshua is found laying on his face with the elders of Israel, and they're pouring dirt on each other's head and sackcloth and ash. And check this out. This is what happened. God comes, and he stands by Joshua and over him, and he said, what are you doing down there? Get up! Now listen what he said. He said, the reason you lost the war at Ai is because do, during, listen to this, during your greatest victory in Jericho, while the victory celebration was going on, there was a man that took a bar of gold, he took some silver, 20 shekels of silver, and a beautiful Babylonian garment. Here, you got to deal with the sin in the camp. Okay, the sin was dealt with. Everybody say secret sin. If you walked into Achan's tent, man, this is beautiful. This is nice, man. This is cool. Boy, you got, where'd you get this new furniture? I'm telling you right now, I need, I need a couch like that. Where'd you get that? Oh, you did at home? Yeah, at home just got about anything you need. You go into that store, you lose your mind plus your pocketbook. Anyways, it's a good place at home. We need to take out some kind of, I don't know, stock in that home. I don't care. Get what you want, do it like you want. I don't care. I don't care anymore. Okay. So here, now Joshua has to deal with things that he didn't want to deal with. Not on just a personal level, but what has happened on a personal level has affected corporate battle. Corporate victory. Am I making sense to that? Is this clear? Somebody said, What are you doing? Trying to get you to discern your heart. Not trying to get you to talk you out of anything. Trying to get you not to discern anything else but to examine yourselves. Watch now. Cycle's been broken, the wandering is over. They've stepped into their promised destiny. They're walking it out day by day. They all, listen, the man that committed the sin had just been circumcised. Are you listening to me? He was aware of what he was doing. Stay with me. We're going to go now. Watch now. A lot of wonderful things has happened. God has established victory, great celebrations. There are wonderful relationships being established. Achan finally confessed to sin and he said, look, man, he said, I got a beautiful Babylonian garment. It took my attention. I got 20 pieces of shekels, uh, 20 uh, shekels of silver and a bar, 50 shekel pound bar of gold, and I buried it in my tent. But to go inside the tent and look at it, you wouldn't even know it was there because it was buried. Can I say something to you? Seeds are to be planted. You don't bury a seed. You plant a seed. I don't, I don't know if you got if you're getting that. There are certain things that need to be buried in the kingdom, but then there are certain things that need to be planted and watered and grow and fill earth. Everybody say, there's some things that need to be buried. Yeah, there's some things that need to be buried, but there's also some things that need to be planted. Now, I really mean this. I'm almost done. But this next part, I was going to go on further, and the Lord said, wait, 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 wait a minute. He said, you better warn the people if they're not careful, history's going to repeat itself. Do you realize that in the Bible, in the New Testament book, do you realize that the Bible says that God gave this story for an example unto you and I as an example that we should be aware basically of the pitfalls and the mistakes and the decisions that Israel made and that we don't make the same. How many of you know that? Lift your hand. Watch now. Watch this.
the Lord told, spoke to my heart and He said, I want you to go back to Numbers chapter 32. Everybody say, under the direction of Moses. So I went to Numbers chapter 32, and I want to read you these words that, that honestly, and I'm not just saying that they chill me. Numbers chapter 32, verse 5. Or let's just read it like this. Now the sons of Reuben, verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben and Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And the sons of Reuben and Gad, or the tribe of the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half of Manasseh joins them later, had a very great multitude of cattle. And they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead on the east side of the Jordan. And behold, the place was suitable for cattle. We have cattle. cattle. It is suitable. It's on the east side of the Jordan, not on the west in the promised land. It's on the east side the land of Gilead and Jazer. So the sons of Gad, the sons of Reuben, came and said to Moses and Eleazar, the priests and the leaders of the congregation. Listen to what they say. They say, The land the Lord has smote before the congregation of Israel, talking about the land of Gilead and Jazer, is a land for cattle, and we, your servants, have cattle. Many cattle. And they said to Moses, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants for a possession and do not take us over the Jordan into what God promised us. What? Can you imagine not wanting to go into the promise of God? Stay with me. Stay with me. They said, we love the land of Jazer and Gilead. It's a wonderful place for cattle. No doubt, green pastures and your servants, we have a lot of cattle. Give us the land of Gilead and Jazer. Do not take us over the Jordan. We don't want to live in the promised land. We want to live right here. Moses looked at him and he said, don't do this. In verse 7, you're going to discourage all the other people. Don't do this. These two and a half tribes were saying to Moses and the children of Israel, listen what they're saying. We still love you. We're not going to go back to sin, but we don't want to live in the land that God has promised. We will obey God. Look, we will obey God. Numbers 32, 32. Listen to what they say. We will pass over with you armed to do battle before the Lord into the land of Canaan. We will help you establish victory, but after victory has been established, we don't want to live in the promised land that God has promised us. We want to go back to the land of Gilead and Jazer on the east side of the Jordan. Two and a half tribes say, we're going to do what we think is right for us and our families. We know that's God's promise and we'll go fight with you, Carrie, to get the promise established for you and these other nine and a half tribes. But after victory has been established, we are leaving the land that God has promised us and we're going right back to Gilead and Jazer. We're going to cross that river. And by the way, what we plan on doing is because the green, green grass, we're going to grow our cattle, we're going to grow our our sheep, we're going to build our houses, we're going to build schools, we're going to build shopping centers, we're going to build uh, such a wonderful, wonderful, listen to what they did. We're going to build this wonderful city and then we're going to put a wall around it. Because if you studied out, Gilead and Jazer were indef- was an indefensible location. Can you imagine not wanting what God... Listen. How many of you still with me? Yeah, I lost some. Are you thinking? We still want to be in fellowship, but we're going to do what we think's best. In the land on the east side of the Jordan, Gilead and Jazer, we're going to build homes, we're going to build houses, we're going to build schools, we're going to build malls, we're going to build a city, we're going to raise our cattle, we're going to raise our sheep. This is what we're going to do. Stay with me. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. Proverbs 14, 12. 
There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end are the ways of death. Look at the word way. A course of life that has been chosen. Listen now. A course of life that has been chosen. A mode of action that has been taken that seems right. Human reasoning and human logic has a lot to do with the words in this scripture, seemeth right. Humanistic wisdom and reasoning based on self-satisfaction of the individuals based on how much the individuals will benefit. God's will is not considered. This is what we think is right for us. So we understand that on the west side of the Jordan, that is what God has promised us, but we don't want what God has promised us. We'll go in and help you establish victory, and the nine and a half tribes can enjoy it, but we're going right back over here, Lydia. How come you're going on? Because I think it's right for me and my family. One theologian says that they went and they built their houses in Gilead and Jazer. One theologian says this. I can't prove it, but this is what he said. He said, and their children became idol worshipers and their wives became prostitutes. I see something in the church world today, and I'm not just saying right here. I'm saying in America. God, I don't want that. I don't want that, God, because that might cause some uncomfortable righteousness. And right now, I need to breathe. I'd rather breathe in uncomfortable righteousness than be living outside of God's will. Inside God's will, there's no failure. Outside God's will, there's no success. Listen. No matter how convincing or well-intentioned, no matter how convincing or well intentioned our ideas and actions may be. If they are not in alignment with God's plans and standards, can lead to unexpected consequences. In the end, doing things our own way, which is one of the definitions of sin, will lead to spiritual death. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Oh, listen, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to go do things their own way, but the Lord laid on Jesus the iniquity of all these like sheep because the iniquity was the sheep was doing what they thought was right in their own eyes when they knew God. Now Jesus came to do what? To bring us back together again with the Father. What was He bringing us back together with? The plains of Gilead and Jazer? No, the land of Canaan, the land that flows with milk and honey. I'm bringing you back to my will for your life. Will you come back to my will for your life and get rid of the spiritual glaucoma and get a little bit of spiritual testosterone and let's go with this thing? Oh, you're leaving. Listen, whatever. You're religious, okay. But I'm not going to do it the way I think it should be done. Mel, I'm going to find out what God is saying. And by the help and grace of God, and by long suffering, and by fear and trembling, I'm going to do my best to do it His way. And if I make a mistake, hopefully I can discern between the two lights. Hopefully I can discern condemnation and conviction. A lot of you in this house say, I'm your daddy. If I'm your daddy and she's your mama, Papa, speak to me. Or am I just a preacher? No. I'm not afraid. Somebody said, oh, I'm coming back. Well, and they will do what seems to be right. Sounds really, I'm not being condescending. If I begin to tell you about the seared consciousness that is coming to America, it would make some of you tremble because 
the seared consciousness where God no longer deals with man, but man has made up his own theology and goes by his household theology and not by what the Word of God says because of a seared conscience that, you know what, I'm sick and tired of people. I'm sick and... Listen, I understand that you love God and you've given up on people. But will you come on the ladder with me? And let's dialogue about this thing called on this rock he said I will build my church he didn't call me to build the church he looked at me and he said you're the material I'm going to build the church out of the church that he builds the gates of hell shall not prevail can well you know I done this and I done this and I done this and I done this yeah and you know what God forgave all that stuff yeah, but we got caught up in this and we got caught up in this. And you know, yeah, it's had an effect on my kids too. But we're getting breakthroughs. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Lift your hand. Because I've heard this from multiple people. And I said, man, God, they know about it. I don't have to address it. He said, they're telling you about it because I'm going to tell you to address it. How many of that just made sense to you? Lift your hand. Multiple people. Yeah, you're my daddy. Yeah, okay, we'll see. You okay, Taylor? Or Taylor Cash, you can't read him. His hair sticks up this high on his head, and his hair sticks out this far on his face. He's the one that told me, he said, man, Pastor, I think you should grow a mullet. I said, you don't think I can, do you? And he goes, I dare you. And I said, I can grow as much hair on the back of my head than you can on the top of yours. I went and got my hair cut from Bert, and Bert looked at me after she got done cutting my hair, cutting that mullet off. She said, that's four haircuts right there. So I'm just letting you know. It's been, it's been documented and stated. I love it. You all right? What do you think? Makes you think, don't it? You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't just come to make us feel good. Can I tell you what the Holy Spirit did in the book of Acts? He came to make them feel good, but then he also came to make them think. Lost in the think. To search out your heart and to discern your heart through and by the power of the Holy Spirit and the written word. Can I be honest with you? Boy, I'm really going to go here. I'm going to share this. It's okay. Um, I told the Lord, he said, um, I've been trying to broaden the platform of your ministry and the ministry of the church, but you won't let me. I said, what? He said, I've been trying to broaden the platform of the church, but you won't let me because you're right on the verge of having an independent spirit. I said, God, what do you mean? I don't have an independent spirit. He said, you don't have an independent spirit. I said, you were on the verge. I said, what is it? He said, I've put you in places around people of influence, and you have rejected to step into the place that I have told you to. He said, at times, you don't even have to say a word, Tim. You just need to be there. That's what he said. I said, Lord, please forgive. Now I ask you, is there anything wrong with me asking him to forgive me? I said, Lord, now that I see this and now that I feel this, please forgive me. Immediately when that happened, when I asked him to forgive me, I, I kid you not, immediately, immediately, I'm talking in two days, God put me in front of people, before people, carrying on conversations with people that are in certain areas over this state. I never asked for it. Who looked at me and said, here, take this card. I looked at the card and she said, this is my own personal cell phone. Call me. I called her the next day. Is that me? I usually tear them cards up and throw them away because I ain't getting involved in government. But God told me, he said, I'm asking you if you will take a step into the government realm and you won't have to say a word. Just show up. I've always done this. 
that moonwalk thing, going back. You take care of the government, I'll take care of the church. But I've come to the conclusion that the church takes care of the government. But I want to tell you something. I want you to hear this. I will not compromise in this house when it comes to biblical standards and biblical order. I will not. All of a sudden, all these things start lining up. All of a sudden, all these things start lining up. There was another man. I've met him the last three years. For the last two years, I've met him. and This isn't about me. This is about this house. Joseph, listen. This is about this house. This is about children's ministry. This is about youth ministry. This is about the worship ministry. This is about uh, celebrate recovery. What I'm talking about is about this house, not an individual. But somebody's got to lead the way. It's not about ego. It's not about prestige or pride because I've already been real strong with God and I told God if that starts happening to me, take me home. Somebody said that's a foolish prayer. I mean it. Listen. All of a sudden, favor starts rolling out of the bag. All of a sudden, man, I'm just, I mean, a lady comes up to me and she starts saying all these things and I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, dear Lord, are you kidding me? She said, no, tell your wife to call me because I want to get in contact with her again because we need to come and do this. And, and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Where do, I mean, all of a sudden, favor just begins to roll. Sitting at my desk, sitting at my desk at eight minutes after nine, three weeks ago, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want you to go to a church across town. Went to a church across town just to be there and worship. I said, I can be here for 20 minutes. The pastor turned the service to me and told me to decree and declare over the church. Favor. Platform is, somebody said, you're bragging. I'm not bragging. It's about this house. How many of you want to be a center of influence? Lift your hand real high. How many of you really want to fulfill what God's called you to fulfill? Lift your hand real high. We're not here to put a thumb on something and to micromanage something, but we are here. Listen, there's got to be an order and there's got to be a standard. I'm not going back across to the east side of the Jordan. I'm staying on the west side. I'm staying in the what God has promised me. I'm getting everything he has promised me. I want all that he has for me. I want to be more than what I am. I do not want to live below my means. Not one more minute, not one more second. My question is, can you cast out a devil? Jesus said, the works that I've done, you shall do also even greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father and he sends back to you the Holy Spirit. When he was here on this earth, he never did a miracle as God. He did a miracle as a man filled with the same spirit that you and I are filled with so he could live, leave for you and I an example. I don't know if we still sing it or not, but remember that song, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask is to be like him. All I ask is to be like him. Are you kidding me? But Lydia, it says in Rome, is that God's main objective is to conform and transform us into the image of his son Jesus. How does he conform and transform us through the image of his son Jesus? Through a method that we no longer preach about called sanctification. It is a progressive manifestation of the Holy Spirit in your life on a daily basis. No, no. You can't have, no. You can't have that kind of attitude. Huh. You, you, can't, you, you can't do that. Well, somebody says, well, what do I do about it? You know what I do? I go to my prayer closet. I get down on my knees. I put my head in the corner and say, my attitude. Whew. How many of you ever had a bad attitude and never prayed about it? still got the bad attitude. It's not that it manifests all the time, but every time a certain situation comes up, here comes that thing. That's sick, sick, sick. You can't control your mouth. You can't control your life. Woo! Put that in the pot and stir it up in the stew. If you're still with me, lift your hand real high. Now I'm going to ask you a very important question. How many of you love Jesus? Lift your hand real high. How many of you know what I'm talking about right now? It's truth. Lift your hand and keep it up. Lift the other hand and begin to praise him, begin to magnify him, begin to thank him. Come on, begin to thank him right now. Somebody pray in the Holy Spirit. Man, we got to get this seed in us. we got to get this seed in us because the platform, the platform, God is bringing growth to what he is doing in this house. But we cannot compromise.
two and a half tribes. He said, we're not going into the promise. We'll go over there and we'll help the nine and a half tribes establish victory in every area. I believe it's in Joshua chapter 22. I, I'm not sure if I'm right about that or not because I kind of just floating on this this morning. No, the, everybody say the Holy Ghost. I think it's Joshua chapter 22, some of the saddest scripture you'll ever read in the Bible, where it says, and after victory had been established over certain regions in the land of Canaan, that the Gadites, the Reubenites, and half of Manasseh said, hey, it's been good being apart. Where are you going? Oh, we're going back across the Jordan because we feel like that's better. We, we feel like it's better. What do you mean? This is what God has planned. This is what God has destined for. No, no. We feel like it's better on the east side. Love you. Call me. Text me. We're still in fellowship. Love you. What? Really? Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Part of humankind stubborn, part of humankind's stubborn and rebellious nature is the pull towards things that dishonor God. Individuals prefer to follow their own selfish ways rather than obey God's command and instructions. That's Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say when we shall continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If you're dead to sin, how can you continue to live in sin? That's what the Father has joined us back together with Him for. How can you, how many of you hear what I'm saying? Say yes. Paul challenges the faulty notion that believers may continue to sin and remain secure and guilt-free in their salvation because of God's grace. People who will hold on to the misguided view felt that they were not obligated to God's moral law as long as they had faith and relied on God's grace. Paul stood very strong against this twisted view of God's grace by presenting one of the most basic of all spiritual truths about the lives of those who are justified through Christ. True believers are identified is being in Christ because they are dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God. Romans chapter 6 verse 11. This means that they are free from sin. Everybody say, in Christ, I'm free from sin. But Paul said, I'm going to get rid of this twist. He told them, I'm going to get rid of this twisted notion you have about grace. Just because you have grace and faith in God, you think you can continue in this way, do not use grace as an occasion to give in to the lust of your flesh. Dave Cox? How about it? Somebody said, and I, we don't want this to feel like a hammer because it's not a hammer. It's a word that's going to get us thinking. And we're not going to, in our thoughts, we're not going to be bound by human logic and human reasoning looking for a middle-of-the-road place of safety. In Christ, there is no middle-of-the-road place of safety. You're either in Him. Come on. What about this? What about when Paul was talking about that? He said, what about, this? What about baptism? He did. This just come to me right now. He said, what about water baptism? Water baptism simply means that you are died in Christ when you go into water and you're resurrected in new life in Christ, a sinless life, regenerated and joined back together with the Father. When you come back, how many of you know that? Say yes. How many of you want God's best for your life? Stand to your feet right now if you want God's best. Last week, last week I had a lady meet me in the middle row and she said, I got something I want to give you after service. And I said, all right. She brought it up to me. It was wrapped up in a bag. I smelt it before it got to me. A skunk weed. Along with her box of marijuana, her baggie of marijuana, and her pipe filled. She said, I'm done. I got Dave Cox. I said, Dave, we went up there. I bet you sewer rats are still high as a kite this morning. 
We flash the dope down. I, it's dope. We, that's what I call it. Sorry, I'm from the 70s, just an old hippie, you know. Flushed it down the toilet. Told Dave Cox, I said, take this pipe, destroy it. He went and destroyed the pipe, took a picture of it. See, we come here this morning expecting children's shirts and all these other activities to happen. They didn't happen this morning. Don't you let people talk you out of what the Bible says. Uh-uh. Ain't it? I'm not going to let people talk me out of what the Bible says. I'm not going to turn to human logic and human reasoning just because they prophesy and get one or two things right. <laughs> Wasn't long ago they advertised one guy as a prophet and they said, come and hear him. 55% of the time he's right. They went. Because they're thinking maybe 50. Boy, how many are ready to lean in to Jesus? Lift your hand. Ready to lean in to Jesus. And when I say lean into him, I'm not talking about a legalistic thing. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about on a daily basis where we just walk with him and we talk with him. We're an open vessel to him. In us, there is a continual praise. It might not always sound good and it might not always have the right words that attract, but he understands what I'm saying. He understands when I use certain words. He understands me completely. How many of you hear what I'm saying? I want to ask you a question. How many of you here standing right now, right now, you're here right now, and one of your biggest problems is, and God's going to bring it to you right now, you just need an inner healing. If you're here right now and you believe you need inner healing, you've been hurt. You've been rejected. Lift your hand real high if that's you. Every one of you that just lift your hands, I want you to come and stand up here in the front. People for inner healing, I want you to come right now. People for inner healing, you've been hurt. You've been rejected. You've been abused. You've been neglected. You've been treated like a second-rate Christian. You, matter of fact, some of the abuse comes from yourself. Come on, get in here. It's time. Can we not in the church world, can we not start being the family that God has called us to be and stop divorcing each other? Those of you that believe in prayer, I mean you believe in prayer. I want you to lift your hands this way right now. I don't want you to come forward. I just want you to lift your hand. Victory shall be established. Victory shall be established. I need God's hand. God's hand. Victory shall be established. In some of your lives, history has repeated itself again and again and again. But right now, we ask that cycle in the mighty name of Jesus to be broken through the act of obedience right now. Through the act of obedience of coming forward right now. Through the act of obedience of taking steps towards God. Not towards man or a denomination or a fellowship or a church name or title. But taking steps towards God. Come on, lift your hands this way. Some of you prayer warriors just start praying in the Holy Ghost right now. I mean right now, in the name of the Lord, we declare and decree freedom, God, in the lives of these men and women, God. We decree and declare, God, an inner healing, Lord, in the name of Jesus, the hurts, God, the trials, God, the words that are rehearsed over and over in their minds, God, in the name of Jesus.